Now I'd like to introduce to you uh, Major General Michael Jeffrey. Um, you'll see a, a bio of Michael Jeffrey inside the front cover of your conference book in your conference bag, but um, he has filled many, many important roles in public life in Australia since he retired from long service in the Australian Army. Uh, he was Governor of Western Australia and he was Governor General of, of Australia. Uh, and he's here today to open our conference in his role as the National Advocate for Soil Health. Thank you. Jeffrey. Well, thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Chris. And uh, Councillor Rinaldi, can I just say uh, what a beautiful city you have here in uh, Ballarat. My earliest experience of it was as a young Lieutenant in the Special Air Service Regiment about 60 or 70 years ago, whatever it was, when I was running recruit selection courses for the SAS at the Infantry Centre in Holsworthy in uh, Sydney. And one of the tests was to do a force march from Ballarat uh, to uh, Holsworthy with 30 of these young hopeful uh, soldiers, which we did in uh, appropriate time, non stop. At the time, I didn't really appreciate the attractiveness of Ballarat, but I've been here many times since, and I think the uh, ambience of your city and it's of the pride of the people in the city and the way it looks is a great credit to you all, and uh, I'd be grateful if you could pass that message to your, uh, to your council. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a tremendous uh, pleasure for me uh, to be here today, and thanks very much for inviting me uh, to this wonderful city to open your third international uh, conference. And uh, as Chris has just done, could I uh, also welcome the overseas guests, most of whom I think I met last night. And I trust that all of you will leave the conference inspired and impressed by the work of Controlled Traffic Farming Australia. Now, you might be all be wondering, what is an 82-year-old white-haired bloke who's been a soldier and a few other things doing, talking to a, a, a group of experts in the farming business. Well, there are two reasons for it. But prior to becoming a soldier, I spent all my school holidays on a farm in the southwest of Western Australia. And I very nearly became a farmer until I went to the school cadets and I went into the military. But I've always retained a great love of farming and agriculture and the farming uh, communities. And I tried to demonstrate that as governor and, and governor general with many, many visits to country uh, centres and farms and so on. But the other reason is that I've got 10 grandchildren. Uh, well, my wife and I have 10 grandchildren. And as a soldier, you have to tend to think about global problems that might happen in 10, 5, 10, 15 or 20 years. It's called st strategy. And my personal belief is that the planet is heading for a train smash. And it's going to be based on soil, water and food security issues. And those issues are going to be exacerbated in countries like India, China, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, Pakistan and so on, uh, for reasons that I'll explain briefly later on. But the big thing is that while Australia has some problems in the way we manage our landscapes, We've also got the solutions. And my job as the soil advocate, and indeed as the founding chairman of a, a group of farmers called Soils for Life, is to demonstrate that those solutions can be generated right across the country for the good of the country, but even as importantly, I think, to export the knowledge of those solutions to the countries that I've just mentioned. If we doubled food production tomorrow, we'd feed 80 million people if we doubled it, if we could double it tomorrow, which we can't, we'd feed 80 million people. But if we exported knowledge of leading farming practice, I call it regenerative, we might then feed or help to feed a billion people. And that would make Australia relevant in our region and, uh, and globally. So they're the reasons why I've taken on the soil advocate uh, role and uh, I've greatly enjoyed uh, uh, doing it. But um, I was appointed in 2012 uh, and I hope the federal government will retain the role on completion of my term, which is all pro bono. It has a huge staff of one, that is me, 
Uh, but I think we are bit by bit making some in, in, in back. And I believe that we need this advocacy on, on restoring the health of the soils and the importance of the soils more and more because we face the combined impacts of uh, climate variability, climate change, drought, salinity, nutrient runoff, and the alarming fact in my view, which is not really widely talked about, that 50% of the rain that falls on Australia simply evaporates. It does not get into the soil. That is 25 times the quantity of water in all our dams and five times the quantity of water in all our rivers goes straight back up there because it can't get into the soil. And part of that reason why it can't get into the soil is due to soil compaction. And of course, that's where uh, your business is in terms of uh, uh, looking at the principle of controlled uh, traffic. Now, my other uh, hat besides the soil advocate is as the founding chairman of a not-for-profit called uh, Soils for Life. This is 24 leading, what I call leading farming case studies around the country. We're going to roll them out to 100 in the next two or three years. And uh, the objective of that program or project is quite simply to restore, maintain and preserve the health of the Australian agricultural landscape, which comprises 55% of the continent, 470 million hectares of land you guys are running, 90,000 or 100,000 of you, on behalf of 23 or 24 million urban Australians who don't know much about it and don't care until you get a flood or until you get a drought. And that's when they put their 50 bucks into cart hay from A to B, which doesn't fix up many farms. So Soils for Life is, a, is I think, a very interesting program. You can look it up on the website, uh, soilsforlife.org.au, and I think you'll find it very interesting. And also have a look at our Facebook group. We've got about a thousand members around the, uh, including around the world, they all talk to each other through various issues and so on. Interesting, many of that group, um, young people studying regenerative agriculture or getting into farming and learning from our wise case study examples. And when I'm talking about regenerative, I'm not talking about something that's uh, uh, philosophical or way out there. I'm simply talking about integrating the management of the three core components of a healthy landscape. That is the soil, microbial nutrient fungal function, the water, that is the hydrology. It does absolutely no good evaporating or sitting in a dam if it's not being used. It's got to get into the soil, back up through the plants, transpiring into the uh, atmosphere, and if we're lucky, falling as local road 50 clicks down the road through what used to be known as a small water cycle. And the third component is the plants. Biodiversity rather than monocultures tends to be the thing. If you've got cattle or grazing, that is the fourth component. Now, to me, as the soil advocate and as a very simple uh, former soldier, the whole key to regenerating the health of our agricultural landscape is by successfully integrating the management of your soil, water, plants, and where appropriate, your animals. And let me give you another simple fact that I've observed, that if you mess up any single one of those three or four, the others fail. Yet we tend to look at things in a stovepipe fashion. Soil scientists do it, water scientists, agronomists do it. Farmers can do it. We've got to start thinking now totally as an integrated passage, uh, package every time, albeit you might be an expert in soil or water or uh, uh, an expert in particular aspects of farming and so on. So that I think is, uh, is, is very important. And that's what our uh, case studies in Source for Life have done. They've successfully scored the, uh, what I call the landscape trifecta, and they're successfully integrating the management of their soils, their water, their plants, where appropriate, uh, the animals. The majority of our case studies at this point are uh, livestock or mixed farms rather than 100% cropping. But when we go to the 100 case studies around the country, that will change. And I understand there are some difficulties or challenges in, in adopting some of the controlled uh, traffic practices 
to broadacre cropping operations, but uh, uh, to broadacre uh, uh, gra uh, grazing operations, but they too can learn from you. Uh, because again, it seems to me sensible to have controlled traffic routes across paddocks rather than screaming all over them in a four-wheeler. However, cropping does feature in our case study uh, portfolio, and we've got a case study at uh, Camden, and I think that uh, is, is demonstrated pretty uh, well. So our case study farmers, ladies and gentlemen, are all highly productive, and they're making money, and their goals are the same, I suspect, as your goals. And I understand that controlled traffic farming's got a fairly long history with a board goal to benefit not only your farms, but your environment and the environment of your catchment. And of course, to preserve and maintain your precious soils. Indeed, one of our case studies is a catchment, it's Maloon Creek. You might have seen it on, uh, what was it, Four Corners uh, uh, the other day with Peter Andrews and a mob of, of people. And what I want to do with that catchment, which consists of about 12 farmers all working together to regenerate the health of their streams and where they've got their streams now flowing for 12 months of the year. I want to see about 20 of those catchments around, separate, you know, spread around the, uh, the state. So we've got three or four as models. And then somebody might say, gee, this is not a bad plot for the Murray Darling, or this is not a bad plot for the Geiscoin, or this is not a bad plot for the Clarence. We might start to do things as total projects over 10 or 20 years instead of fiddling around the little itty bitties here and there which uh, while with the best of intentions doesn't always get the maximum uh, maximum effect um, so healthy soil i think is really the is the uh, is the name of the uh, the, uh, the game and the big thing about uh, getting a healthier soil is really about increasing your carbon uh, levels. Soil, healthy soil, regenerated soil, non-compacted soil, active working soil has a proven capacity to draw down carbon and keep it there. Yet we've literally overlooked it in the national debate about climate change. Simply put, I believe along with former Chief Scientist Robin Battenham, that healthy soils have the capacity to absorb, like a sponge, at least sufficient CO2 to meet our Paris Agreement target. And accordingly, we should be pursuing with the utmost vigour a cheap, accurate, broad acre soil carbon measurement system. I find it staggering. You can stick a satellite on the other side of the moon or of Mars, and yet we can't measure soil carbon. Yet soil carbon levels are the fundamental indicator, I am told, of the, of the general condition of our soil. Not the total, but a fundamental. If carbon levels are going up, your soil's getting better. If carbon levels are going down, you're in trouble. And could I put it to you, that generally across Australia, our carbon levels have been going down, down, down. Four to five percent now to about an average of one. Now, such a system, if we could do it, may well demonstrate the possibility of neutralising Australia's total industrial emissions of around 550 million tonnes of CO2. Now, think about what that would mean politically if it could be done. You've got 470 million hectares of countryside, or a bag of landscape, all you've got to do is pull down about a tonne and a half per hectare. Some of our case studies are pulling down 10 and 20 tonnes. So even tonne and a half, if we did it, neutralise those emissions, that then allows governments to transition to some sort of sensible energy policy without everybody running around like ch chickens with their heads chopped off, so wondering whether they're going to keep a coal fire power station open or go to wind power tomorrow or whatever it might be. You know where I'm coming from. Now, I'm not saying that this is totally possible, but it ought to be looked at so that we can say, yes, OK, even if we did half the emissions, wouldn't that be a great thing? So carbon, I think, uh, is, a, is, a, is a, a, a great thing in, in uh, sequestration potential, and indeed it might even be possible to catch up with the last 50 years' legacy of CO2 emissions into the uh, atmosphere, but whatever. Uh, the, the situation. I don't think we've been focusing hard enough on the possible answer that is sequestering carbon into our soils through enhancing our photosynthetic capacity. That's the answer to climate change in, in terms of 
adjusting to it. It's got to be done through photosynthesis. It's got to be done through the plants. There's no other way than trying to catch a bit of carbon and stick it in the in aquifers and so on. That's ridiculous. It's got to be done through the, the big movers and uh, shakers. And the other thing I think about carbon, of course, is its capacity to uh, help retain uh, water in the soil. Every gram of carbon you put in the soil, it facilitates the holding of up to eight grams of water. Eight to one. Every gram of carbon you lose, you lose that capacity. And could I suggest to you, that's broadly speaking what we've been doing across the country for a long time. It's nobody's fault, nobody's to blame. We all do things in terms of the way we're taught, what we can afford and so on. But I think it's time to take a stock take of what we've been doing and see whether we can't do some things just a little uh, bit uh, better. And of course to sequester carbon, as you well know, the key things are to slow down water. So much of it is running off very quickly uh, from uh, hillsides and so on, taking topsoil with it. And now we've got about a million kilometres of streams a lot of them in our agricultural landscapes that are now excised so deeply that they if this is the floodplain, the streams are now flowing below the floodplain. And that's, uh, that's not the way Australia used to operate. The streams used to flow above the floodplain. And then when you got rain, they flow gently over the banks into the floodplain, down into the next floodplain, down into the next floodplain. And it was the floodplains that kept the water in the, in the soil and got us through droughts. So if you stuff up the management of your streams, then again, the whole system uh, collapse. So we've got to do something about that. Um, soils like uh, not, only, uh, not only can they absorb and convert CO2, uh, but obviously poor land management practice can also uh, squeeze it out. Uh, and I think uh, soil in itself that, uh, that while I'm talking about soil, I always, well, I should be all really talking about uh, agricultural landscape and, and, and the three or two or three other components. But the problems that we have in Australia are all fixable. The problems we've got across the planet, I, I think it's dicey. The only way we're going to fix the planetary problems is if we're going to get international goodwill and some brains and intelligence of looking at the issues. Uh, otherwise, I think there is a problem. And the big issue, of course, is how we're going to feed 10 billion people by 2050, up from 7 billion today, when we're losing agricultural land at the rate of about 1% per year. So do the maths on that. When every major river in East and uh, uh, Central Asia is now heavily polluted, um, when uh, in China, India, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East and so on, just about all the aquifers that created the Green Revolution, along with fertilizers, all those aquifers, or many of them, were established over geo uh, geological time, millions of years, and they're being pumped dry. And there's no replacement for them. So what are we going to do? When the ice shields that are uh, providing the uh, water into the uh, uh, Mekong and into uh, the Ganges and other big rivers, the ice shields and the Himalayas are now melting. So that's going to reduce the flows into those huge rivers, uh, etc. And I could go on and on and on. What I'm trying to say to you is that we've got a big, uh, a big uh, uh, problem. What have we got? Two minutes to go till nine o'clock. Okay, uh, <laughs> I'm a quarter of the way through, but we'll sum up. <laughs> so, so what I'm trying to say is that we, we've really got to get the soil, water, plants, animals. Uh, work together and, and integrated. And what have, what have I done or tried to do? We put a policy paper to the government uh, 12 months ago. Uh, uh, I had Abbott signed up, ticked the day he got deposed. We had Turnbull signed up, about to go out to Maloon Creek to that Australian story, do we have it ticked? And he got deposed on that very <laughs> day. And now it's for all this, all my fault. And, uh, and, uh, and now uh, Prime Minister Morrison's in, in, in perhaps uh, difficult circumstances, but the opposition, I think, will, uh, will take it on. So we've developed a, uh, we've developed a, a, a plan, which I think is a pretty good one, which has 
as its fundamental aim to restore and maintain the health of the Australian agricultural landscape by integrating the management of our soil, water, plants and animals. I want to see our soil, water and plants declared as key national strategic assets. Key national strategic assets to be managed accordingly in an integrated way. I want to see the primary people that are looking after those assets, our farmers, rewarded fairly both in price for their product, that's not my problem, but it's got to be dealt with, but rewarded for restoring the health of their landscapes instead of you guys carrying that whole debt. I want to see urban Australia reconnected with its rural roots by putting a garden, a vegetable garden, in every primary and junior high school in the country, but with a mandated syllabus. So that by the time every kid reaches 16, every kid understands soil, water, plant function, the importance of farmers, and we get lots of kids going into ag science and so on. I want to do a stock take of our, our agricultural science knowledge. We've got a lot of good, it's, but it's all penny packeted over the place. I want to re-establish our soil, uh, our uh, research stations in each state and increase that and have a proper career plan for young ag science going into those ag stations five years at a time and then into the departments of agriculture to get some wisdom into those departments. And finally, I want to look at regulatory overburden. I think that is my time. There's a lot in this, but rest assured, we're going to punch very hard to get these key things through. And please have a look at the website because you'll see the policy paper and what we're trying to do uh, are clearly uh, spelled out there, and I think you'll find it's worthwhile. Thanks very much. Oh, I've got to open the conference. The conference is now open. Well done. <laughs>